service center of the Lever Samba. Few words about his career. In 1992, he got a PhD in the State University of New York in Stony Brook, in the US. In 2004, he joined the Jefferson Lab, and before he was a fellow at High Central in Germany, and also he did some postdoctoral, uh, he was a postdoctoral research fellow in some universities of Germany, like Tunisia and Baku. Uh, Among the topics that he uh, uh, has uh, developed in his career, we can find the Kira's Fidelity Breaking, QCD DQ. Uh, and non perturbative aspects of QCD. Uh, uh, and nowadays, he's uh, um, the deputy spokesperson of two experiments to be developed in the Jefferson Lab. And he's uh, working now uh, in the, the future electron ion collider, in particular, in new measurements uh, for nuclear physics. And today, this is the topic uh, that we will have. Uh, Thank you for the kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. There are many connections now between Inan and uh, Jefferson Lab, and I really always want to uh, be here and, and, and talk to people directly. Uh, many thanks to Caesar for arranging this colloquium. This uh, lecture will be about the physics of strong interaction, so the internal structure of the nucleon, quantum chromal dynamics, and the experimental tools that we use to explore them, which is mostly high energy lepton scattering. This is a, a big part of modern uh, nuclear physics, and in spite of uh, four decades of effort, many basic questions about nucleon structure in QCD still remain um, unsolved. And as you um, may have heard, there, is now, um, there are now plans to develop a next generation facility, the so-called electron-ion collider, to address these outstanding questions. And this will be a focus of this um, colloquium here. And I think it's a very nice focus because it allows us to um, talk about not just what we have accomplished so far, but to take a step back and ask um, where do we really want to go? What are the important questions we want to answer? And um, this is um, very much the spirit in which the community is now approaching this uh, electron ion collider. And I think it has had a very um, positive impact already as a hypothetical future facility. And I want to share some of this um, impact with you. So here's the uh, uh, plan for this lecture. We'll be talking about the internal structure of the nucleon, the microscopic theory of quantum chromodynamics, the concepts and methods for articulating the structure and the physical characteristics of the dynamical system. And that's um, important to spend some time there because we're really dealing with a very unique dynamical system. Um, the nucleon in QCD is fully relativistic, it's quantum mechanical, and it's strongly coupled. We need very special concepts to deal with that system. We'll then talk about high energy electron scattering, um, the distinction between fixed target and colliding beam experiments, and future facilities, the Jefferson Lab 12 GB upgrade, which is just now coming on, uh, online, it's a fixed target facility and the future electron ion collider. And then we will have a look at uh, what questions in quantum thermodynamics and nuclear structure could be addressed with a future electron ion collider? This includes things like quantum and polarization, spatial distributions, and orbital motion of quarks, and um, quarks and muons in nuclei, and the QCP origin of the nuclear nuclear interaction. And finally, a few words about the path forward with this future facility. First, some motivation why. Are we interested in quantum chromodynamics, the internal structure of the nucleon? Well, we're really dealing with the fundamental structure of matter. Um, actually, 99, more than 99% of the visible mass in the universe is from strong fields. And these nice things that the Hubble telescope sees, these are not Higgs bosons, these are strong fields. 
called dynamical biosymmetry gradient, and um, we really want to understand where they come from. Uh, we also want to understand the phases of matter at high density and temperature, because that's needed for the early universe. And we want to understand the conversion of radiation into matter, which plays a role in uh, cosmic ray physics. The second ma major motivation is we want to understand nuclei and nuclear reactions from first principles. So um, we really want to um, look, uh, unravel the QCD origin of the nuclear nuclear reaction. And this kind of understanding is important for nuclear energy, stellar structure, astrophysical processes, and also for the treatment interactions with the nuclei. Lastly, um, quantum thermodynamics has been a major both driver and consumer of methods, advanced methods in quantum field theory. These include perturbative methods, the renormalization group, topological fields, spontaneous synergy rating, etc. And um, all of them are used to understand this wonderful dynamical system, as well as numerical, large scale numerical simulations in uh, lattice gauge theory. So enough about motivation, let us um, jump right in. So the beginning of modern strong interaction physics was really when it was discovered that there are point-like objects called quarks inside hadrons. So if we, so the typical uh, size of a nucleon, a proton, a neutron is about one um, phantom meter. If we look at that system with a resolution much smaller than that scale, we find that there are point-like objects called quarks. They are practically massless. Their rest mass is less than 1% of the total mass. They turn out to be fermions with spin one half, and they couple to electromagnetic and weak charge. And that's how we see them using external probes. Now, it was realized then later that these uh, Quarks are not free particles, they interact. Um, they, and these reactions are governed by a, um, a gauge theory, quantum field theory, um, uh, which is very much like electrodynamics, but it has a, um, a charge that takes values in the S in an SU3 group, a monobelian group, and as a result of that, the gauge boson called the muon couples to itself. And this has all kinds of consequences. One of them being that the effective coupling decreases with the distance. This is the celebrated property of asymptotic freedom. So this here shows the equivalent of the fine structure constant in quantum thermodynamics as a function of distance. And you see it really decreases at short distances due to these quantum effects. If we go to slightly larger distances, around about 0.3 Fermi, so if we slightly widen the scope of our um, lens here, then some very interesting phenomena um, take place. We are uh, starting to see strong gauge fields and they create a condensate of quark anti quark pairs. And uh, this is where the dynamic generation of mass takes place. And so, really, all we're dealing with a, a, a really fascinating dynamical system where the dynamics changes with the resolution of the scale. Now, so ever since QCD was um, discovered, there has been the, the desire to understand nuclear structure from first principles um, in QCD. And this is really a very unique dynamical system because it's fully relativistic. So the, uh, um, the momenta are much larger than the masses of the constituents. There are creation annihilation processes, particle numbers not conserved. It's quantum mechanical. It can exist in a superposition of different configurations. And it's strongly coupled. And if you think of other systems in atomic or nuclear physics, each one of them already is a major challenge. But here in PCD, no construction in PCD, but even with all three of them at the same time, you really have to develop methods and concepts that are appropriate to that. Now, there are two basic approaches to deal with the system. One is the Field theoretical description. Here one um, makes the transition to imaginary time. 
um, upon which this quantum field theory basically becomes a kind of statistical mechanics with a positive definite weight. And it can be simulated on a space-time lattice. This is a very large effort. Many groups are involved in that. There's much progress. And um, it's a very nice method for computing um, static properties of the nuclear. But what one does not have in this approach is any concept of a particle content or composite structure of the loop. Um, so I would like to view the loop as say consisting of a number of particles, we would like to see it move in real time, and this does not come from this approach. So to arrive at such a particle-based description, um, one has to take a different route. Now, in, in non-relativistic physics, this would be done through the wave function of the system. So you have an atom, you have the wave function, we can compute densities, and that will tell us about the spatial structure, the orbital motion, etc. of the system. Um, one problem in relativistic system is that the concept of wave function is generally frame dependent because it relies on the notion of equal time. There is no such thing as a absolute uh, equal time in, uh, in uh, relativistic systems. So um, to make this more dramatic, we can imagine that some quark, anti-quark pair was present uh, at a certain time, and one observer might say, oh, this happened at a certain time, and I count this as part of my wave function. Another observer has a different time, and says it doesn't see this pair as, uh, as, uh, as part of the wave function. So however, there is one, um, choice of time variable, which is really uh, distinct and it's appropriate for relativistic systems. And that is called light from time. And that corresponds to um, um, the time t plus z equals constant. I realize that, that it should really be a factor of the velocity of light here. It's with c times t. I'm working in units where c is equal to 1. So, um, don't get confused about this. But this really corresponds to something synchronizing the clocks in your system by adding a light wave, or some kind of stroboscopic light moving through the system. This is a frame independent time, because the, uh, the speed of light is the same in all frames. It's appropriate for relativistic systems. And it's very natural for high energy scattering. Because a high energy scattering process basically probes the structure of the system at fixed light from time. And actually, uh, this light from time, looking at the system at uh, t plus z equals constant, allows us to think of the nucleon as a composite system, now in the quantum mechanical sense. In a certain sense, we can think of this nucleon as consisting of configurations containing different numbers of particles, say, three quarks, three quarks of quark plus an anti quark, quark plus a mu, three quarks plus a mu, plus many, many particles. Now, this is somewhat symbolic, and um, very few practical calculations are done in this representation, but conceptually it's very important. So this kind of light from, you know, the system that fixed light from time really allows us, the degree gives us a composite picture of the nucleon, as a superposition of configurations with different numbers of constituents. Is so that the only way you can realize this uh, superposition? Or if you work I would say it's, it's the only um, uh, Lorentz invariant way, or the only way that is um, uh, not, not frame dependent. So, um, so short answer, yes, it's the only way. <laughs> So, and um, you see what we write here is really a description of the nucleon as a, as a relativistic many body system con consisting of components with different particle numbers. So, later when we do high energy scattering, the high energy process can observe the, the system in components with different um, particle numbers, and we will see um, examples of that. So, if we think this further, we can uh, say what are the physical characteristics of the system in this uh, representation. So the, uh, the momenta of the constituents in this approach are now characterized by what's called the light form momentum, which is the sum of the energy and the z uh, momentum. So, um, so it's really very simple. 
just instead of the ordinary non relativistic momentum, we just think of this constituents as, as having a field classified by the light from momentum. Or what one usually does is one uh, measures the light from momentum of the constituent as a fraction of the light from momentum of the total system. This variable is called x. And it's, uh, it's limited uh, by uh, 0 and 1. And now, in this way of thinking about the group structure, we have immediately access to the physical characteristics of the group now. What are they? They are um, the momentum densities of quarks, anti quarks, and muons, the spin distributions in a polarized neutron, the transverse spatial distributions. How, how the uh, boson groups are distributed in transfer space, and even their orbital motion and spin orbit effects. And all these physical characteristics can be defined and uh, properly defined and interpreted in this framework. And um, they are defined through um, for quantum muon distributions, and these um, objects are really can really be represented, or these observables can really be represented as matrix elements of certain second quantized QCD operators which can be properly normalized, uh, renormalized, and can study this scale dependent. So they are typically of this form. This is a nucleon expectation value of some operator that is bilinear in the quark fields or in the muon fields. And this such an operator measures a spin or momentum density of these constituents in uh, light from time. And the important message here is that these, um, these matrix elements can be calculated in lattice QCD for using non perturbative methods. So that's how the, the cycle really closes. So we can define densities of the system that can be interpreted as momentum or spin densities in light from time. We can represent them through matrix elements of certain QCD operators, and those can then be compared with uh, theoretical calculations in uh, lattice QCD. And of course, these light from momentum densities are measured in high energy scattering processes. And, um, so let's have a look at the uh, gluon densities in the, uh, in the nucleon. So this figure here shows a, the result of a global analysis of the warp gluon densities. These are the U valence, D valence warp density, and the C or gluon density, they are divided by a factor of 10 because they, they, they become very large and small x. And we see some very interesting behavior here. So at um, that, see here, again, x is the fractional light for uh, momentum. Um, at values of x around 0 0.2, 0 0.3, we see that the u valence and d valence component uh, distributions, densities, dominate. So here we're really dealing with the and it's a three quark component of the nucleon many body system. If we go slightly down in x to around 10 to the minus 1, this is a very interesting region. You see that the valence quark densities are non, still non zero, but there's a substantial amount of C quarks and muons. So here we're really having a, a, a very rich system containing of valence quarks, C quarks, and muons, which still. They still carry quantum numbers, they are polarized, etc. Et if you go further down in x below 10 to the minus 2, you see that everything is dominated now by the blue and C4 densities, and we have yet another component of our system, component with very high uh, particle densities, carrying a very small fraction of the neutron's light form domain. So um, what you see here is really um, we can identify the basic particle content of the nucleon in QCD, and we really see the different components of our many body system at, um, uh, at work here. So now it's time to move on to electron scattering because that is actually how we um, probe these different components of the system. So um, the electromagnetic interaction is very well understood. It couples to the electromagnetic current of the quarks and anti-quarks. In inelastic scattering, we have two 
basic kinematic variables. We have the momentum transfer, Q, event momentum transfer. This basically defines the spatial resolution of our probe, the transverse spatial resolution with which we look at the system. It's one of the two. And we have the energy transfer in the, uh, from the electron, which is the nu. And that basically defines the momentum fraction of the constituents that we're probing as this ratio of 2 squared over 2 and n So you see, we have two basic variables. Um, and we can use them to scan the system at different values of the momentum transfer, at different values of the spatial resolution, and probing constituents carrying a different uh, momentum fraction. Now, the, the range of these variables uh, is limited by the electron nucleon collision energy through this relation here. And just as an example, if you want to probe the system at, say, Q squared with 10 GB squared, it corresponds to resolutions of roughly 0.130, and you want to probe constituents of x 0.1. We need center of mass energies that are in excess of 100 GeV squared. We want to go down to x of 0 0.01, we need 1,000 GeV squared. So we really see we need to um, we need to do uh, in order to um, scan our system at short, at small resolution scales and resolve constituents at small x. We really need to do electron scattering. At the center of mass energies of um, at, of the order of a few ten or a hundred GeV, so that the square is um, um, is, is larger than uh, say a thousand GeV square. Uh, is this calculated for x target or for like this energy? This is um, I get to that on the next slide. This is the, the center of mass energy. It doesn't it doesn't care how it is um, realized. It can be you will see the answer in the, in, the, in the next slide. So, as the question just anticipated, there are two basic technologies to do electron scattering. One is to shoot a beam of electrons at a fixed target. This can be solid, liquid, or gas target. Here, it's relatively easy to achieve high rates simply because of the nuclear density in the target. In this case, the square center of mass energy grows linearly in the electron beam energy. Another technology is to collide a beam of electrons and a beam of protons or nuclei. In this case, the square center of mass energy grows like the product of the beam energies. And you see, it's immediately much easier to achieve higher energies in this way. It's also much more energy efficient because we can make the beams collide multiple times. If they are in storage rings, if they are bunch of beams, they can go around many, many times and we can have a bunch of collisions many, many times over. Whereas in fixed target experiments, we basically dump the beam. Once the beam hits the target, it's, it's done. And we dump huge amounts of energy with simple calculation with um, uh, looking at the, the, um, the beam energy and the beam current, what amounts of beam energy you dump, at, um, and it's, it, it can easily be of the order of several megawatt for um, uh, for standard for the energies we hope to achieve. There are also distinct experimental advantages in colliding beam experiments. For example, there are no atomic electrons in the target that can cause a scattering. There are big nuisance. One can do, um, one can range the energy such that the collision products come out at large angles. It's not that everything is forward boosted as a fixed target. And one can detect slow hard modes coming out of the high energy process, which in fixed target experiments would normally get, get stuck in the target or could not uh, escape. Now, such, such uh, colliding beam experiments are technically very demanding. Um, these beams of very high quality, focusing, cooling, time structure. And they also require a high degree of integration of the detectors with the, uh, with the accelerator. 
It's not like a fixed target that you basically say break for V to V to target, and then you start putting detectors around here in the, in the collider. Everything has to be designed um, basically in, in one um, um, uh, as, as, as one unit. And there is now a lot of experience with uh, storage rings for um, E plus and minus collisions. For proton and proton, for proton and anti proton collisions, this is the Rig, Tevatron, the LHC. For uh, ion ion collisions, again the Rig and the LHC. And there was one collider for electron proton collisions, which was the, uh, the HERA collider, which operated until about uh, 10 years ago. So, um, another important Characteristic of electron scattering facilities is the luminosity. Basically, it, it defines the number of theoretical, pos theoretically possibly possible collisions per per second. Or it's defined in such a way that the observed rate for a certain process is given by the product of the luminosity and the cross section. High luminosity is required in particular if you want to measure rare processes spin asymmetries, if you have multiple variables, you want to be multidimensional in these variables, or if you need measurements of high statistical precision. And luminosity has actually been the limiting factor in most nuclear structure experiments so far. Now this figure here shows the existing lepton nuclear lepton nucleus facilities distributed over the center of mass energy and the luminosity. The luminosity is measured in funny units uh, uh, per square centimeter per second and it has huge numbers because it was uh, Avogadro's numbers if you, if you so like. And um, up here at the highest luminosities and uh, center of mass energies of the order of a few GB you see the uh, high duty cycle fixed target machines Mines, Bates, uh, Jefferson Lab. Down here, at slightly higher energies and at very low, rather low luminosities, are the, um, the muon, the, the CERN muon beam experiments. Here's the HERA the electron photon collider. And um, you see Mark and Color here, two facilities which will extend the combined energy luminosity. From here. One is the JLA 12 GB upgrade, which will deliver the, the highest energy uh, at, the, uh, at the highest available uh, fixed target luminosities. Here. The other, which is marked by this big uh, full square here, are the electron ion providers, which is really, um, uh, this, which is this next generation facility that um, I will talk about in a minute. And you see, it's really designed to fill this gaping hole in the um, energy luminosity from here. So it, it would achieve um, luminosities between 10 to the 33 and 10 to the 34 per square centimeter per second over a wide range of center of mass energies, basically from uh, around 20 GeV to more than 100 GeV. And this is the uh, next generation facility that um, is presently under consideration. Let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the physical layout of these uh, facilities. So first the Jefferson Lab GE, 12 GE upgrade. As said, this, um, um, this facility is just coming online. The upgrade project at Jefferson Lab is now complete. The accelerator uh, is um, has been upgraded to a GE energy, the, the uh, detection equipment as well, and uh, it is just now uh, taking data. So this is basically a race track kind of accelerator with uh, linear accelerators and arcs that uh, res uh, reserve the electricity. It uh, uses a unique superconducting radio frequency technology and energy recovery. And it can deliver a continuous beam up of up to around 100 microamps. 
And this facility has been operating since uh, 1994. There are four experimental halls. Two halls, A and C, use high-resolution magnetic spectrometers. Um, hall B uses the class large acceptance detector for uh, electric production. And then there's a new, uh, a new hall that was constructed as part of the third GB upgrade that has the UX detector and does uh, photo production. And, uh, say, Cesar's research becomes very closely tied to the spectroscopy program in uh, UX and class. There's a very rich physics program for this facility involving exotic meson spectroscopy, three dimensional neutral structure and QCD, short range nuclear physics, and electric weak physics. And um, I will not talk about this here, I just invite you to visit this uh, web page. And as I said, this facility has been upgraded now to 12 GB energy, and the physics operations have just started. And beyond this, we're looking at the uh, electron ion collider. Now for, um, for this facility, two designs have been proposed in RRD developed. Um, Jefferson Lab has, uh, is, is working on a green green design, which uses um, so so uh, uh, basically where it is two storage rooms really. Um, um, one for the electrons, one for the protons or nuclei. It uses the 12 GB C bath as an electron injector and would supplement it with a um, proton ion booster and a storage ring of about a one kilometer circumference, which would, um, uh, so this would allow collisions of 3 to 12 GB electrons on 8 to 100 GB protons. Higher proton energies would be. Uh, possible through magnet upgrades. The luminosity will be of the order 10 to 34 over a wide range of energies. <coughs> and one important characteristic is the layout of the ring is in a figure 8, so that the spin precession for polarized particles compensates each other in one turn, and this is essential to have the polarized uh, do so the Brookhaven National Lab is proposing a linear ring design called a rig where the present rig 250 GB proton beam um, would be made to collide with electrons in a linear accelerator um, of energy 10 to 20 GB. The luminosities would be over the 10 to the 33 to 34 per square centimeter, again over a wide range. And here the focus is very much on uh, reusing the um, uh, available uh, width detectors. There are also related proposals. There is a CERN LHEC design, which will achieve much higher energies but uh, lower luminosities and with a focus on uh, uh, particle physics. And there is a there are now plans for EIC in China, which uh, uses a design very similar to the Jefferson Lab. So I realize this is a very high level overview. I want to go on for hours uh, explaining these designs, but I just want to introduce them here. And um, so what can we do with these uh, facilities? How can we come back and uh, probe our main body system, that is the movement? This figure shows the kinematic coverage in X and Q squared. Um, that will be provided by the Jefferson Lab 3G upgrade and the electron ion collider designs. And you see that with the JLab 3G upgrade, we can probe very nicely the valence support region of the nuclear at X round about 0.1, basically. With the EIC, we can open up the whole wide region of C ports and neurons at sites slightly so smaller X. And we also have a lever arm in Q squared to study the, the scale patterns in Q squared position. And these capabilities are very much complementary, and this is uh, by design. So, in the following, we just want to have a look at a few examples of what one can do with these uh, facilities. And 
Again, our template will be that we have this many body system that is local. We want to probe these different components and we want to probe them in increasing detail, not just the momentum densities, but also spin, um, um, spin densities, polarization effects, spatial distributions, orbital motion, etc. etc. So, first one example from deficit map 12 GB, that's a measurement of the valence core polarization. So one basic question is if you have a nucleon that's polarized, say in the Z direction, how are the valence quarks polarized at x going to 1? This really tells us about the basic free quark component of the nuclear wave function. Um, it tells us about what non determinative QCD interactions are at work in, uh, in this system. And it tells us whether there is orbital angular momentum in the nuclear wave function. Now, um, the D, we're particularly interested in the d-quark polarization, which one can get from inclusive scattering on the neutron using isospin symmetry, namely that the, the d-quark distribution in the proton is the same as the d-quark in the neutron. This figure here shows a measurement of the uh, neutron spin asymmetry in the elastic scattering at large, X, you see it's very poorly constrained by the present data. And with the JLAB 12 GB upgrade, we could measure data of the quality shown by the, uh, the colored dot here. Here, so you, you see, we could really do a very nice, precise measurement of the um, valence quark uh, polarization. And this will discriminate between different um, theoretical predictions, for example, based on the curve of QCD. All based on the uh, SU6 number, the ST symmetry group. And there are many other applications along these lines. You can measure the spatial distributions, orbital motions, etc., all at large X with the JLAB 12GD upgrade. Let's now come to the um, electron ion collider. And the um, equally interesting question is how the C quarks in the nucleon are polarized. By C quarks, we mean these additional quark anti quark pairs that can be present in our relativistic system. They are created by QCD interactions, the carry quantum numbers, and um, we're very interested in, in, in studying their properties to find out what the interactions or are that cause these uh, C quarks to uh, come about. And um, so one basic question is how the C quarks are polarized. And um, the, this will tell us about the mechanism uh, in QCD that causes these um, C quarks to, uh, to pop up into non nuclear interactions. It's also related to the question of the resonic degrees of freedom, whether the neutron's pion cloud contributes to the electronic structure. Now, such C quarks can be measured with a method called semi inclusive scattering where we identify the struck quark through a hadron in the fragmentation region by measuring, say, a pion or kaon. In this way, we can tag the charge and flavor of the struck quark. Um, the flavor decomposition of the C quark is presently very poorly determined. This here, um, this figure here shows uh, the, this is the polarized density of U anti quarks and of D anti quarks. The U band is our present state of knowledge. You see, we basically cannot tell anything about the polarization of the U and D anti quarks. Again, with the EIC, we can do a beautiful measurement of semi inclusive deep elastic scattering, really map the, the spin dependence um, of the polarized, of the uh, U and D C quark distributions as shown by the, by the red bands here. Even more important, perhaps, is the polarization of muons in the nucleon. Um, here, one basic question is how is the nucleon spin decomposed over quarks and muons? We now have this picture of the nucleon as a many body system, a composite picture with different components of the wave function, quark, anti quarks, and muons. So, the basic question is how are 
static properties of the neutron, like the spin, decompose all these constituents. And uh, one can define the total quark spin and the total muon spin as the integral over x of this polarized quark uh, muon distribution. And then there's a sum rule that's saying that the sum of the quark and muon spin plus contributions from orbital and angular momentum have to add up to the neutron spin. And one major goal of a neutron structure has to be to measure independently these terms in the sum rule and verify that indeed uh, they add up to one half. And a um, major say, gap in our knowledge is that we, we know very little about the muon polarization. Because muons cannot be measured directly at a fixed scale, uh, they, they don't couple the electric magnetic curve, they can be inferred only indirectly through the Q squared variation of the structure functions. Or through hard processes in polarized proton proton scattering, which is done at the Rick uh, collider. Now, this figure here shows our, our lack of knowledge of the muon polarization versus the quark polarization from the current data. With the electron ion collider, we could dramatically reduce this uncertainty really to a, a fully quantitative measurement of the gluon polarization as shown by the red and yellow ovals here. And this way, um, determine the spin decomposition of the gluon. Um, 
as in its fully transform describes the spatial distribution of particles with a certain x in the loop curve. And there's a large um, a theory effort in say, describing these reactions, modeling the generalized carbon distribution. And here, I just want to show you one example of what could be done with an electron ion collider. We could measure the transverse area, so basically the average B squared occupied by all by muons and pores in the neutron, and how it changes with, with the x of the pore and neutron. And you see, you see, we can do a very nice, really differential measurement of the uh, muon and quark size of the neutron. We could find out whether, for example, muons sit tend to sit at smaller impact parameters than quarks, as we tell us about uh, um, the, the, the dynamics that give rise to non perfect muons in the neutron. And I want to go even further and measure not just the transverse area, but the whole transverse distribution, the profile of the nucleon, and construct something like a tomographic image of the nucleon in this way. And if you're interested, you can find the pictures in the EIC white paper. So let me come to a new topic. We have at the university in Germany, uh, where I went to school, there was one professor who was famous for starting a new topic always five minutes before the end of the lecture. So let me follow his tradition here, but I assure you that we will be done in five minutes. And this new topic is nuclear interactions. Because we, we want to, so, so far we've been talking about the internal structure of the nuclear, AQC. We also uh, want to learn how nucleons interact in QC, what causes them to, uh, um, say, for example, to experience attractive repulsive reactions to form finite nuclei. And um, we want to understand how does the nucleon interaction emerge from quantum thermodynamics. And this can be done through by studying the core nucleon structure of nuclei. Because that whole nucleon structure nuclear is modified by nuclear interactions. Um, and the mechanisms acting at different energies and distances um, tell us about what interactions are at work here. And they are, the main mechanisms are illustrated in this cartoon here. So at x larger than 0.3, the main effect of the nucleus is to modify the single nucleon structure. This is called, so called the BMC effect. There might, um, for example, this nucleon might be squeezed, or there might be non nucleonic degrees of freedom uh, induced in this nucleon. That's like. What is the BMC effect? I think it's a European UN collaboration. It's a, a historical. So, um, at, at slightly smaller x, around 0.1, the quark-gluon structure of the nucleus is modified by pairwise nucleon nucleon interactions, which are related to the exchange mechanisms between the nucleons. For example, if a meson or a quark is exchanged between two nucleons, that registers in the deviation of the nuclear quark-gluon density from the sum of the individual nucleon density. If we go even further down x, below um, 10 to the minus 2, we see another interesting nuclear effect. We start to see collective gluon fields or the phenomena of shadow and saturation. So basically, this means if you pick up, say, gluon at x below 10 to the minus 1 from the nucleus, we cannot associate it with any individual nucleon. It becomes a kind of coherent property of the whole uh, nucleus. All these Nuclear modifications can be studied with the electron ion collider in, the, in these different regions of X, and they tell us about different aspects of the nuclear nuclear interaction you see. And I want to show only one example here, which is measurements of gluons in nuclei. So this figure here shows the ratio of the nuclear gluon density to the gluon density in a sum of A nucleons. And what is known presently about the nuclear modification, you see that at low x there are 
Um, the, the more density in the nucleus is suppressed. This is called the shadowing effect. And this was now recently observed by LHC experiments, particularly uh, by uh, Anise in algebraical Cape Side. Um, at larger x, there is some expectation that gluons are enhanced around x of 0.1 and that they are suppressed at x uh, uh, larger than 0.3. But the error bands are really huge. Basically, you don't know anything about nuclear gluons above uh, x of 0.1. And with the electron ion collider, you could measure these nuclear gluons directly through heavy torque production, which is called open charm or open duty production. And um, I cannot go into any details here, but suffice it to say, what would really do a, a very nice uh, uh, differential measurement of the nuclear modification. Of gluons, and this way you convincingly establish whether there is enhancement and uh, so, uh, the x one suppression at larger x. And this will tell us about the QCD origin of the nuclear um, interaction. So we have a question. In the case yeah. of the electron
There is an EIC user group that was formed in 2016. It now involves more than 600 physicists and uh, more of 100 institutions. And by the way, I'm giving you the, the, the links here so you can save the PDF of my slides. You can you just uh, click on that. The next step here um, will be to initiate the critical decision process of the U.S. Department of Energy. The first is called CE0, and then eventually to select a site for a particular design for this accelerator. The timeline for these next steps is um, unfortunately rather tentative at the moment. Um, there is um, EIC accelerator, detector, physics, and theory research and development ongoing at the, U the U.S. National Labs at Brookhaven, Jefferson Lab, now also at Argonne, Lawrence Berkeley, as well as in university groups. There are many concrete R&D projects involving all kinds of things, detector elements, uh, certain simulations of certain physics processes, some theoretical developments, whatever, radiative corrections, or um, there are many ways to join to contribute. There is great interest in the nuclear and accelerator physics communities. The ESC is now um, well represented at conferences. There are many ESC topical workshops and programs, and there is growing international participation. I have just listed here the people in, in, in Mexico who I know are um, associated with ESC and can serve as contact or to ask a question. This is uh, 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 Maria Elena Tichet-Lomitz uh, from Sonora, uh, Oval Kova here from uh, CPSDA, Alejandro Ayala is here, and uh, Martin Chichitsky uh, at Puebla. Uh, so if you have any questions or would like more contacts, uh, I would refer you uh, to these people. And um, this brings me to my summary. So um, if one of the dynamics with the microscopic theory of strong reactions, the dynamics changes with the resolution scale, the long distance behavior is still fully understood. You see that the neutron can be interpreted as a relativistic many body system, high energy scattering probes different components at varying at, at, at scales. Um, We've learned to identify more and more complex characteristics of the nucleon, such as polarization, spatial size, nucleon interactions. And there's a major need for visualization, interpretation, and communication still in this area. That's something that is very acutely realized if you start going out and talking about EIC or the nucleon structure programs and people not in the field of nuclear physics. This is certainly an area where um, we um, contact with the outside world and um, um, where a lot of people um, accomplished. So. And lastly, we've looked at the electron ion provider as a next generation facility. We've looked at the critical variables of energy, luminosity, polarization, and detection. We've not spoken about detection, but we trust that it's uh, absolutely essential. And there is a realistic path forward for this facility. And with that, I'd like to conclude. Thank you.
good question. That question and its proper answer will easily be the entire you know, um, co conference and, and, and not, not just one. Um, so, first of all, I uh, agree that shadowing and saturation are different physical phenomena. Shadowing is basically, um, to come back to this picture here, is a quantum mechanical interference effect that um, tells us that um, if, if the coherence length of the probe is large, if it's large, larger than the interval from distance or even the loop is size, then um, the probe can interact coherently with all the ones along its path. And then the, um, the cross section is not just the sum of the cross section of the individual loops, but there are interference. Uh, interference terms. And this happens at the level of the, the leading twist loop muon density that really uh, uh, goes into hard processes. Um, now, saturation is a similar effect, except that it involves um, the generation of a new dynamical scale, which is called the saturation state. In some sense, it amounts to a higher twist effect in the elastic scattering, but that is usually enhanced because of this scale. So, um, just mechanically, shadowing and saturation are different, um, say, effects, even though both of them involve the collective interaction of all nucleons. <coughs>
they both address the same, by, by and large, the same, say, uh, goals as to what, what energy, what luminosity uh, should be achieved, what physics is to be done. Um, right now, the, um, we're going to say everyone is working to refine their designs to provide the realization of the EIC as envisioned in the EIC uh, by paper. Um, the further course will really be, um, say, up, um, up to the Department of Energy with input uh, from the community to decide, um, not even to decide about, uh, to choose a design, but to, to define the process by which a design will be, be chosen. It's before, um, it's, it will, what's the time scale? I'm, I'm not the right person to, to, to answer that, I'm not so well connected, but I, I would think it's unlikely that it would happen before five years from now. And um, so in some sense, at the moment, what's important for this whole project to survive, and the, the, the site selection will come uh, sometime later, and most likely after critical decision zero. So uh, critical decision zero means acknowledgement of mission need, so that the uh, um, officially says yes, um, the scientific priorities require this facility. Built. And then, um, then eventually there will be a site selection. But by that time, say the designs may have evolved, or the, um, the, the target parameters might have slightly shifted. So there's a, I mean, a lot can happen between now and then. Because 
a single free nucleon which did not produce something that's larger than x equals 1. We need a two nucleon cluster, three nucleon cluster in the nucleus. And there is a whole program at Jefferson Lab. some references about specific short-range and correlations in 